Good morning, everybody. Well, let's get started with our lecture after like this uh, slight technical difficulties. The funny thing is, just last week I boasted in front of our new director that I have never had a problem with the Beamer before. Well, there is a first time for everything, right? So <laughs> it's okay, it's okay compared to, to other problems, that is nothing. Um, this is uh, lecture 14, and what we are going to do today is uh, ever so briefly recap what we have been doing last week. But then we are uh, moving on to something new. Um, we have been talking about linear filters in the last couple of lectures. Well, not in the last two, uh, but in the week uh, before last week. And uh, so far, it appeared that um, you know, the kind of filters we've been looking at were low pass filters, blunt pass filters, high pass filters. We uh, developed the idea of filtering coming from the domain of the Fourier transform. Uh, we already saw that there are some issues related to low pass or high pass filters that have to do with finite support either in the space or in the frequency domain uh, being equivalent to infinite support either in the frequency or in the space domain. And we saw that there are of filters such as in Gaussian uh, that are of rather limited support in both domains. And, um, but those are not the only kinds of filters we can study. So today we will look into um, another very popular filter, the mean filter, and then extend our newfound knowledge. Well, it's not really extended, but it's really going on to, to something else. Um, that is, we are beginning to study the idea of media filters. But uh, ever, ever, ever so briefly. Uh, what have we been discussing in the last two lectures? Uh, basically the idea that functions are infinite dimensional vectors. And uh, to make that explicit, we write them using uh, these symbols here. So this, this is supposed to indicate a vector. And um, if this vector indicates the whole function, then uh, the notation we are used to, say f of x, is just a way of denoting the value of the function at some point x. Or, with respect to this uh, newfound vector space, this would be the value of the function in dimension x. Um, we discussed the idea of inner products between functions. Um, we discussed the idea of outer products between functions. We saw that if we integrate, now these are continuous functions, so we have to integrate, integrate over all outer products, um, and this um, vector xi, this is the Greek letter xi here, supposed to be a unit vector, a basis vector, then uh, that should provide us with the identity. Uh, we then begin lots of algebraic substitutions um, to get a feeling for the manipulation of cats and bras. Uh, recognize that this is basically a vector times a matrix times a vector, which you can also understand as an inner product times another inner product. Uh, all these things we did. And uh, one of the reasons for us to do that was to, um, well, how to say it, begin to develop an understanding of this very peculiar function delta x minus xi, um, which, let me skip that, we found has this property that if we integrate over this function, if we integrate this function over a certain interval, it produces one, um, and that allowed us to define the notion of basis vectors in this very abstract Hilbert space of functions. Uh, it's basically, um, there are two sides to this coin. On the one hand side, this newfound delta function fixes uh, the value of the inner product, but on the other side, uh, other hand, we may indeed understand it as um, the inner product itself. Uh, important thing is, once again, that this function evaluates to zero if uh, this psi here is not equal to one. 
And if that psi is equal to 1, well, then it evaluates to something else which is conceptually infinite. And uh, so this is only understood in this context. So the integral over this function has to be 1. This is a very, very peculiar function. It's called the Dirac delta function. And indeed, it is not a function. Uh, mathematicians call these kind of objects distributions. Uh, those are not the distributions we are known um, that are known to us in the area of uh, probability theory or statistics. Uh, it's, it's an unfortunate uh, double use of, of this terminology. Uh, these are not probability distributions, but distributions generalize the concept of functions, uh, generalize a concept that is well known to us. And. Um, you know, we went on and found that this function here, this delta function, or distribution I should say, is intimately related to the idea of convolution, which we stu studied uh, prior. In particular, we see that if we integrate over the product of this function and um, a function f we are given with respect to all variables xi, this integral reproduces the function f. In particular, this integral produces the value of f at x. Of course, if we do that for any x, it uh, reproduces the function. And that is why this is called the sampling function. So in a sense, if we convolve a given function with the delta distribution, it is or it acts as the uh, identity operator or identity function with respect to convolution. Um, we then looked into the idea of derivatives of this funny function and we found that indeed it has a derivative if we um, integrate any function f uh, times this derivative of the delta, uh, what we get is the derivative of the function f. Uh, we can further generalize that and um, just looking at this notation again realize that this is not a function in the sense we are used to because it looks as if I just switched the uh, differential operator which I indeed do but the meaning of this is actually that this more or less acts as an operator so it is not a function in the usual sense. Uh, going back to the Fourier transform here are how the Fourier transform of a variable uh, function f of x real value function over just one variable is defined. This is the inverse Fourier transform. Um, rearranging the terms within the uh, inverse Fourier transform, in particular plugging in the definition for f of omega, we find that which we can write like this. But now we are in the situation again that we integrate a product of some function. This is a function of, say, omega, uh, a function of x, sorry. Um, this is a function times another function, and it's supposed to produce, reproduce the function we are given. But this then uh, sort of indicates that this expression that appears if we rearrange these definitions for the Fourier transform in its inverse has to be the delta function. Right? And indeed, that is the case. And then uh, I'm, I'm really racing through this, not so, so important for us today. Um, then we looked at the notion of operators in these Hilbert spaces, that is, in these infinite dimensional vector spaces. Uh, for instance, um, we can think about the um, concept of differentiation, an operation that we are very well used to, in terms of the application of an operator to a vector. And we may then ask for, well, okay, so abstractly, uh, we can think of this as a matrix. Right? But these are things that have infinitely many dimensions, so it's, it's not really a matrix in the sense we are used to, but we may think of, of this as a matrix, and we therefore may ask for what are the elements of this operator. And again, if we um, play with these uh, inner outer products and so on and so forth, we find that the elements are indeed these derivatives of the delta function. And um, that is what I just said. 
And then we went on, uh, and this was, you know, just a very abstract uh, jump, conceptual jump. There is no real explanation for why we should do that. This is, um, again, one of these miracles at some point in history. Somebody discovered that and must have been a stroke of genius. There is no clear, uh, I don't know, development. But, you know, now that we have uh, familiarized ourselves with these operators that realize differentiation, um, no, we can create new operators, let's call this one omega, just by, I don't know, multiplying a constant to this operator d. Um, and this constant in our case is minus i, i being the complex unit. And then we asked for the eigenvectors of this new operator capital omega. That is, we asked for the solutions of these equations. Like for there are lots of um, vectors and lots of scalars that might actually solve this equation. We asked for them and we found that after some, again, just algebraic manipulations and uh, renaming of certain elements in these uh, systems of equations, we ended up with a very, well, excuse my, my, my language again, very simple differential equation. So we have a function that if we derive it, produces the function again times something. And this is of course something we are used to from, uh, this is a behavior typically shown by the exponential function. And so the solution to our eigenvector eigenvalue problem is this. Um, and if we fix the scalar constant here, this is factor A, say to 1 over square root of 2 pi, uh, we find that this inner product between the basis vectors x in this Hilbert space and these eigenvectors omega of this operator omega is given by this function. And that can be plugged back into our definition of the Fourier transform and its inverse. And so we find after some you know, really rather abstract mathematics that the Fourier transform is indeed an inner product, which is to say if we compute the Fourier transform of a function f and evaluate it at some frequency omega, then that is the same as if we were to project this vector representing the function f onto a basis vector omega. And uh, since this vector omega is the eigenvector of an operator, uh, all these eigenvectors are orthogonal is indeed another basis. And that is all there is to it. Uh, again, excuse my, my choice of language. Uh, that's not really all there is to it. But um, what we see on this slide is that indeed these things here do some, something that is indeed rather simple. They do it in a context that is not so simple. But uh, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about affine transformations and we studied uh, rotations more or less in detail in order to understand the idea of transiting from one coordinate system to another. But instead of coordinate systems, I could have also said transiting from one basis to another basis system. And here we have uncovered that these crazy integrals that appear in the Fourier transform and its inverse are actually that. They are nothing else but coordinate transformations. The spaces in which they perform these coordinate transformations are rather abstract. They are these Hilbert spaces of continuous uh, functions over the reals. And so um, this is why uh, things look much more complicated than in those, let's say, simple Euclidean vector spaces where we are dealing with finite dimensional vectors and matrices to do that. But here you have it. This is conceptually nothing else than expressing something we are given in a certain basis system, in a certain coordinate system, in another coordinate system. All of this is rather difficult to visualize because the basis elements of these uh, new coordinate systems are mm, complex valued functions, but what can we do? 
at least once again final time I mentioned it this is nothing that is entirely new to us okay now on to new shores um, one of the reasons for us to study the Fourier transform um, was to I don't know uh, appreciate the idea of image filtering in particular we started our study of the Fourier transform and linear filters because we saw that the Fourier transform provides us with a new point of view on functions and again we understand images to be functions and in particular the Fourier transform represents these functions in terms of constituent frequencies rather than say in terms of constituent delta distributions and we thought well what happens if we you know Fourier transform an image and then remove certain frequencies set their contribution to zero by means of low pass high pass one pass filtering and transformed the images back and saw that they were more or less these 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 filters were more or less capable of removing noise so we did all this to get a grip on the problem of noise removal and um, when i looked at these slides this morning i, I thought i should have brought better examples but what can i do here we are uh, <laughs> because as you will see in a second um, the examples I, I not really you know removing noise but let's see um, up until now we basically focused on a certain rather extreme uh, kind of noise the so-called salt and pepper loss here is an original image here is an image which I have uh, slightly distorted just by randomly flipping uh, three percent of the pixels of this image so th those were randomly selected uh, I, I set those random selection of pixels either to, to white or to black but this looks as if you were to salt and pepper the image so this is how it's uh, getting this name this noise salt and pepper noise but that is of course not the only kind of noise that is out there um, here for this image what I did is I disturbed every pixel every pixel um, that is I added or subtracted something to well, subtraction is the same as addition so I added something to it and this something was a random number drawn from a Gaussian so every pixel here is distorted by a random variable that was drawn or sampled from a Gaussian distribution and the uh, variance parameter here was apparently set to 9. And you can see that uh, the image on the right hand side uh, is noisy. It has this, this, this you know, noise. There's this noise. And uh, this is what, what I meant, that uh, the examples I brought were not so, <laughs> not so great. But uh, it goes to show that in addition to the kind of filters we have studied so far, there are other filters. And um, with respect to the original image, it turns out, or it looks like, as if these filtering operations um, produce nothing else but a blurred version of the image. So when we are talking about the filtering, we may think of it as a way of removing noise from an image, but as well as a way of blurring those images. That depends on the application context you're dealing with. Take home message here is there are different kinds of ways as to how that can be done. And um, here is the salt and pepper version of the image and we see that um, the different kind of filters uh, do a more or less different, differently good job in removing uh, this noise from the image. And here is where I'm not so happy with my choice of examples. Uh, those are rather large filter masks. We now know what it is when I'm talking about a filter mask. And uh, yeah, so the median looks, looks as if it performs poorly but this is just an unfortunate choice of this example I should have brought another example as well but we actually have already seen that a couple of weeks ago 
um, when instead of a 13 by 13 mask, I considered a 3 by 3 mask. Back then, the media uh, perfectly removed this salt and pepper noise. And here are examples with respect to the Gaussian noise. And uh, look at this. For this Gaussian noise, this Gaussian filter, smooths the image, you know, rather considerably. Um, but look at this. It is somewhat, uh, in, in, in this series of examples, the filter that is best capable of uh, removing this Gaussian noise. And in that sense, these examples just go to show that for different kinds of noise, let me go back, this noise, this noise, different kinds of noise, uh, there might be different operations that are more or less appropriate to deal with these noise if we want to improve the images, that is to say, if we want to remove the noise from the images. And today we will look into the idea of mean filtering and median filtering. And um, before I continue, I should tell you that in addition to Gaussian noise and salt and pepper noise, there are many other uh, kinds of noise. The fact that this is called Gaussian noise is indicative of, um, again, the fact that the noise results from a certain statistical distortion here. Every pixel in this image has been uh, added. There was, there was some tiny value added to every pixel in this, in this image which results from uh, sampling a Gaussian distribution. This, th in practice, is actually really important. Uh, for instance, um, in the area of uh, medical image analysis, we are often dealing with a kind of noise that is called Ricean noise. This is a Ricean distribution, is another statistical distribution. Um, and it appears in that context because of the technology that is used to record these images. In that sense, we can think of, of this, uh, this is really exaggerated, but Gaussian noise quite often occurs if you actually record um, pictures with your digital cameras and because of the photon counts we discussed in the very first lecture of this uh, semester. Um, there, might, there might be these kind of, of effects there. In medical image uh, analysis you're dealing with different kinds of noise which again are due to different kinds of uh, recording technologies and uh, these examples show you that um, instead of blindly applying a certain filter just because it's the first button in your image processing program, uh, you should think about what kind of a problem you are dealing with and then select the appropriate button in your image processing program. Right. Different kinds of filters, different kinds of effects. This one we have already looked into. Let's look into the idea of a mean filter. <coughs> Remember that when we filtered images so far, we either did that in the frequency domain by cutting off certain frequencies or in terms of convolution in the space domain. And the function we used for convolution in the space domain so far was basically the Gaussian. And um, we discussed the idea that a filter mask is moved over the image and we have to sort of compute the sum of the products of all the values in the filter mask with the underlying pixel values. This is, of course, an averaging process. Right? If we uh, multiply a pixel with another number, we can think of this number as a weight. And if we add all these multiplications, then that is something like computing a mean value, a weighted mean. Particularly, Gaussian distribution has this property that if we add all its components, it gives us one. So it's indeed um, a weighted averaging process. So instead of using the Gaussian, we may just as well use a convolution mask that looks like this. All ones. Right? And the common weight is 1 over m times n if this is m and this is n. So, um, Think of it, 
If you compute the average age of the people in this room, we would add all your ages together and then divide by the number of people in the room. And this is sort of like one times the first age plus one times the second age plus and so on and so forth. And then divide by the number of people in this room. So this is, this is, this is exactly that kind of averaging we are used to do in, let's say, our daily lives. Uh, now expressed in terms of a convolution mask. If we convolve an image with this filter mask, what we get is that every image pixel will now be assigned the average value of all the pixels in this neighborhood. And the neighborhood is defined by the extensions of this mask. Okay? Mm, this is, of course, I mean, if we think of it, this thing has n rows and n columns. So for every pixel, we would have to do, I don't know, a for loop over the rows and a for loop over the columns. So in the end, per pixel, these convolutions require efforts of n times n. We discussed that earlier, okay? Can we push it down? The effort per pixel? Any ideas? Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Very nice. Um, so my question is, can we achieve a complexity of O of M plus N rather than O of M times N? And she already remarked that this very much looks like a separable uh, convolution mask, and indeed it is. So instead of convolving the image with this two-dimensional mask, we may first convolve the image row-wise with um, a, a mask of all ones, let's say divided by n, and then column-wise with a column of all ones divided by n. So yeah, this is another example of something that looks to be separable. And again, we already discussed that, that by means of separating um, convolution masks, we can push down the computational complexity of the problem we are dealing with. I have to point out that uh, not every filter mask is separable, but if they are symmetric, and this one is like totally symmetric because it contains just one, so we can flip it, flip it, rotate it, it's always the same. Right? If they have this property, then we may be able to separate them. So here, um, we can push that down to O of M plus N, which is great. And now there is an outrageous claim. I claim that we can reduce the effort per pixel to O of 1. And that is to say, whereas the a naive implementation, you know, moving this two-dimensional mask over the image and then for every pixel compute a double for loop, um, the effort there would depend on the size of the mask, m rows and columns. Even if we separate the filter mask, it still were, whatever we were to do, would still depend on the size of the filter mask. Not as dramatically as there, but the values m and n would still determine the complexity of our problem. And when I claim that we can achieve mean filtering in O of 1, then that is to say uh, that it does not take just a single operation, right? But what it says is that we can do mean filtering independent of size of the filter mask we are considering. There will be a fixed number of operations regardless if M and N are 3 or 4 or 5000 and 7000. It doesn't make a difference. Now that should uh, you know, make you curious. Is that really possible? How is that possible? And, um, <laughs> yeah, here it is. Again, when I looked uh, through my slides earlier today, I was not so happy with this um, because this is 
from a pedagogical point of view, is, is extremely stupid to, to start like that. But let's see what, what this is about. I claim that if we are given an image right, uh, of dimensions, say capital M and, and capital N, um, we might very frequently be interested in computing another kind of image. So where the original image is called F, uh, we might be interested in computing an image C, where at a coordinate x and y, that is x and y, and given certain parameters m and n, and of course this m and n is sort of the size of a neighborhood, right? um, we want to sum over all pixels in a certain neighborhood defined by m and n, and uh, well, do something with the pixels in the original image. That is, we are given the original image, we may apply a function to the pixel values in the original image, and after we have applied that function to these pixel values, we sum over all the values in some neighborhood about a current location x and y. And if we do that for all the images, here's just one neighborhood, but you know there are lots of neighborhoods here. Uh, if we do that for every combination of x and y, for every location, the result would be uh, such an image C at x and y, depending on a neighborhood size which you know we may choose and of course you see that this is indeed a, a very complicated way of for instance writing down the idea of mean filtering we may think of this function h of f of i and j simply as one divided by m times n times f of i and j right this this uh, This here could sort of be like, you know, the application of the function h to all the pixels in the image. And, and this is just a, another way here in terms of a convolution mask, but from what we discussed earlier, you see that um, this here is sort of a function h applied to all the image in, uh, pixels in a certain neighborhood. And uh, summation is sort of implicit in the idea of so this, this is nothing new. This is nothing new. This is just something we have seen earlier, but still I should not have uh, introduced it like that. Right. And this is again just what I said. Uh, in the context of mean filtering, this function h is just sort of to divide by m times n. That's, that's it. So this is <coughs> the situation we are dealing with. Um, we do want to compute, and they are called integrals, because of this sort of summation over uh, all the values in a certain neighborhood. <coughs> and here is the outrageous claim again. Whenever we are dealing with this situation, and this function h is uh, of a certain benevolent nature, it may be beneficial to actually compute an image capital C that is the sum over all the pixel values uh, we create when we compute oops, uh, this new image C. It, it begins to, to, to get confusing, but bear with me. I claim that in certain situations, if we want to compute such an image lowercase c, it is actually smarter to first compute this and to get this lowercase c out of that, but how is that even possible? And note that I have dropped the m and m here, and that is to say if there is no m and m, then this is implicitly one. A picture says a thousand words. Yeah, let's go over that. Blah, blah. Okay, here it is. We, um, in our context, want to compute the mean value within this uh, red rectangle here. 
Now imagine we were able to compute an image C, so this is the larger image here, where at each pixel we have computed the sum of all the pixels on top and to the left of it. So for the first row, this one would have the sum of this pixel and this pixel. This one would have the sum of that. This is just sort of the sum of all the pixels to the left. Here we would have just the sum of all the pixels on top. This, this pixel in image C would contain the sum of this one plus this plus this plus this plus this plus this so on and so forth. And for pixels not on the, in the first row or first column, say this pixel here, here we would say that this C contains the sum of all the pixels except yeah, well, and, and this one. So this, this, is, this red area here is indicating that at this point, which I call delta, at delta in C we have the sum of all the pixels in this, in this larger rectangle, not just in this smaller rectangle. And um, this, this is basically what this says. See that here we have a summation from 0 to x and y. And uh, let me go back to this one. If, if this is um, x and this is y, then this is to say that in C we sum everything inside this rectangle starting at the 0, 0 coordinate ending at the x, y coordinate. I have in this picture, the x and y is actually here and there, not, not there. But um, I'm using this picture to indicate the great underlying idea here. The idea is that we do want to compute, say, um, the value of this integral image in this region. That is, we are interested in a pixel x and y and have an m n neighborhood around this pixel, some summation going on and maybe scaling and whatever. And we want to do that. And we saw uh, it takes uh, O of m times n or O of m plus n depending on whatever we are interested to compute in the end. But if we assume that we would have computed this image capital C first, and just from looking at the picture for a couple of minutes now, you may have already seen it. We can compute the value inside this rectangle, like so. Here, for this pixel, capital C contains the sum of all these pixels. This pixel, beta, contains the sum of these pixels. Gamma contains the sum of these pixels, and alpha is just this pixel. So the sum of the pixels within the red, bold face red rectangle is the overall sum at this point. But then there is something additional which we don't need. This is additional and this is additional. So we may subtract these, but then we have subtracted this one twice. So we add it. There you go. This was a very unfortunate speech to explain this simple idea. We do want to compute this C at X and Y depending on some M and N. And this is basically a summation, maybe you know, a mean filter operation. You have to sum every pixel in a certain neighborhood. We can do this directly by convolution, we can do it using separated convolutions, or we first compute this image capital C, and once we have that, we go to the coordinate x and y, and then look at x plus m over to the, basically this here, and y plus m over there, I guess I switched the m, and it doesn't matter. Uh, we basically look at the value at this point in capital C. This thing is called delta. And um, we have to subtract this and this. This is what happens here. And once again, since we subtract this one twice, we have to back, add it back into, into the picture. 
And there you have it. So we can compute this here, value of lowercase c at x and y, depending on m and m, in terms of three additions, or well, two of them are subtractions, but this is a constant. This here does not depend on the size of m and n anymore. Um, if we go back to where we defined what we want to do within a certain uh, neighborhood, here we had a double summation that directly depended on the size of this neighborhood. And here this is wrong. Of course, it is still in here, so it, it is not independent of the size of the but the computational effort is independent. Because we do not have to sum over m and n. This could be, I don't know, 500. So then we would have to look up something down here, and you know, well, it doesn't matter. To compute the value which we derive from inside of this neighborhood, we just have to carry out one addition and two subtractions. Hmm. That's great. But it requires us to compute this capital C first, right? And that is, is a bit of a bummer because if we, if we want to compute this capital C, say at this point, we'll have to sum everything here. And then we go there, we have to sum everything there. So it doesn't look as if we win anything, do we? But it turns out that computing this capital C, this, this integral image of integral images, is a triviality. And look at this. Uh, this lowercase c, uh, uppercase c image can be computed highly efficiently. And here is how. We want to compute the value of capital X and Y at this point. And let us assume that these are already there. Well, this is just, you know, we are carrying out a double for loop, one over the rows, one over the columns, and we have already computed the values of capital C at all these points. And now we want to compute it here. Well, again, we could naively sum every pixel, which is like outer for loops, inner for loops, but that is stupid. We can use dynamic programming. Dynamic programming is a term that refers to reuse results that have been obtained earlier. In particular, um, the value of capital C at this point is the sum of all the pixels in here. But this is the value of this pixel plus the sum of all the pixels on top of it plus the sum of all the values left to it. But now we have added something twice which we therefore have to subtract again. This is, this is <laughs> sort of <laughs> inverse to what we just did. Right? To compute the value of capital C at this point, we iterate over the image and simply add this pixel value here, say, to what we have computed for this point, and we also add what we have computed for this point, and now have to subtract what we have computed here because this area has been added twice. There you have it. We only have to iterate over the image once. There is no inner nested for loops, just an iteration called like two, two outer for loops. Here is how it could be done in Python. And this, this is, you know, uh, this just checks if we are in the first row in the first column. We have to worry about these boundary conditions. Um, and if we are not, then we simply carry out <coughs> this operation here. And in the Python code I have switched um, rows and columns because this is how we present matrices. Mm. Now, um, 
your turn. Is this uh, a good idea? The image is, I don't know, 4,000 something times 2,000 something pixels large. In Python? Yeah, in Python. No, no, why not? <laughs> Four loops, yeah. So if you are programming in C, right, or some language such as C, something that is compiled, C or Fortran or if you are computed using a compiler language, then this is the way of doing it. There, heads down, this is how you do it. Right. If you can use dynamic programming, you should use it whenever possible. It's extremely fast. This is a situation where it really makes a lot of sense. Think about it. This, this is beautiful. It's a beautiful example for the power of what is called dynamic programming. In Python, uh, if the size of the image is, um, you know, manageably large, then that's okay. But if the, yeah, I should have used capital M, but anyway, if this becomes large, then this is stupid. In Python, right? Uh, it just requires one pass over the image, and once again. I don't know why I should have used capital M and capital N here because this is supposed to be the size of the image, not the size of the filter mask. Just one loop over the image, no, no local loops over local neighborhoods. That looks good, but four loops are a bad thing to do in Python. Does anybody have an idea um, as to how it could be done better? Okay, this is an unfair question because it requires uh, NumPy experience. Uh, but before we move on, let me repeat. If you are programming in C or C++ or something like that, this is how you do it, period. No other, no other solutions are accepted, right? Because this is by far the fastest thing you can do. It would be fast in Python as well if the for loops would be fast, but they're not. The scripting language takes time. So we have to resort, if possible, to inbuilt functions. And here is how we can do this. There is a, a function called cumsum, cumulative summation. And what that, that does is, let me go back, um, I don't know, to this one. If we apply this numpy function cumsum with respect, say, to the um, row dimension, it, it sums for every row, it sums at every pixel. This would be the sum of this one and this one. This would be the sum of this one, this one, and this one. This is what cumsum does. Right? So we could do that for every row. Once we have done that for every row, we would call it on the result for every column. Right? And uh, convince yourself that that does the same. That this is exactly the same. Why? Why didn't then I introduce it directly? What is the, the drawback here? <laughs> this is very fast. This is not very fast because it depends on inbuilt functions, which are. Um, which, which call libraries, which have been uh, programmed in C or Fortran, I don't even know. Uh, so this is fast, but these are tall for loops. <laughs> and we have to iterate over the image twice. Once we have to compute the cumsum for every row, that is we have to go over the image once, like in every row. Mm -hmm. Then we get a new result, and on this image we have to do that for all the columns. So this is actually twice the effort of this, twice the effort of this, but it does not involve for loops. So if you are uh, doing image processing in Python, you see that this might be preferable. However, once again, if you do it in, in C, then the other idea is better. So this is twice as many computations as the other one. And still, this will be much, much faster in Python which is funny because it's, it's more effort. But be aware of these things. And why, why did I 
talk about these integral images in depth, I don't know, but at least to a certain extent. Um, once it was understood that this idea of let's compute, say, the sum of all the pixels of the image first and then do something with this integral of integrals, because then it, it's more efficient, in particular if we want to compute the value of uh, local summations. Um, once that was understood, it created a real boost in, in the area of um, image processing, in particular real-time image processing. And uh, these integral images are at the heart of yeah, basically most modern face detection uh, algorithms. Uh, for a couple of years now, if you go out and buy a consumer camera, uh, you can switch it to a mode that if you take a picture, it waits until the people that are visible in the picture, the faces, smile. How is the camera able to realize that there are faces and uh, those faces are actually smiling? That is something that's now an integral part of many consumer cameras which did not exist uh, 12 years ago. Right? But 12 years ago, Yola and Jones um, published a paper that was called Rapid Object Detection Using a Boosted Cascade of Simple Features. We'll study that in the next semester. But at the heart of their algorithm is the idea of these um, efficient computations of values inside local neighborhoods. And we saw that this can be broken down into one addition and two subtractions. This is like nothing. At the heart of this uh, paper is this idea of integral images. Once that was understood, it created a tremendous technological boost and uh, in particular, yeah, we can now detect faces in more than real time, so this is what your camera does. It uses variants of these algorithms, and, and these algorithms are all based on the idea of integral images. How that is done in the context of object recognition will be studied in the next semester, but you know already understand it from the point of view of image processing. And um, it does not only work for faces, and it does not only work for uh, integral images, but we can also apply that to histograms, but histograms are something we have not really studied yet, so I'll just mention it and get back to that later. Because um, we will now consider something that is called a median filter. And uh, looking at this picture, it is again just uh, indicative of the fact that, you know, given a certain pixel, we want to compute a new value for this pixel uh, by looking at a certain neighborhood of this pixel. And I am now considering uh, square neighborhoods. That does not have to be the case, but, you know, for the sake of the argument, it doesn't really make lots of but let's assume the neighborhood is an n by n neighborhood. And also, let's assume that this n is an odd number. <laughs> so that we always have a clear defined center. Again, that does not have to be the case, but for the sake of the simplicity of the argument, let us all agree that now it's n by n neighborhoods where the n is an odd number, so that it is clearly defined the center pixel. Hmm? Uh, looking at the picture, it looks very much uh, like what we have been doing so far. But everything we did so far involved the summation over these neighborhoods and then some scaling. Right? The, the mean filter divided the sum of all the pixels, in this case, divided it by n by n. Right? Uh, and the Gaussian also has some, so it's, it's, it's a weighted summation. Now, and those are linear operations. And now we move on to something else something that is not linear. What is at the heart of the median filter is the following idea. We have the image, we assume it's a function, we are considering a certain mask size. We can still think of this as a mask, neighborhood or mask is the same. And at pixel x and y, say this is x, this is y, we have a certain neighborhood. And this set nxy contains all the pixel values in this neighborhood. 
And also for the sake of simplicity, we assume that these are gray value images. That also works for color, but it's a different beast. So this is a gray value image. There are nine pixels in here, and they all have a value between two, uh, 0 and 255. And we collect these nine numbers in this set. And then um, we call them P0, P1, all the way to PM minus 1, where M is N squared. And I really have to emphasize the fact that we begin counting with 0. So even though this is the first pixel, second pixel, third, fourth, fifth, uh, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth pixel, we count this as pixel 0 and this as pixel 8. Well, there are 9 in there because, you know, but we count them as 0 to m minus 1, where m is n squared. I have to emphasize this because what we do next is we order this set. Uh, there are nine numbers in this example, in this set x, y, and now we order them in an increasing fashion. The smallest number becomes the first one, the second smallest number the second one, and this ordered set is called R. And it contains, in our case, nine numbers, and uh, Ri, say not, R0 is less or equal than Ri plus 1, so R0 is less or equal than R1, and so on and so forth. And these numbers here are all taken out of this set MXY. Once this set has been ordered, look at this. The element Rm minus 1 over 2 <laughs> is called the median of the set MXY. Now, r m minus 1 over 2 is some number here. Right, I have ordered them, and now we look at the number in the middle. And that number is called the median. Have you ever heard of medians before in statistics or so? Why are they interesting? To, can, can you tell me what, what, is, what is sort of what, what is special about the median, say, in contrast to the mean? Imagine this. Um, something that has nothing to do with image processing, but I love the example. Um, a village in the Swiss Alps. You know, up until 100 years ago, there were just poor farmers living there. Very hard life, uh, rough nature, steep hills, herding cattle. And then about, I don't know when it started, some 80 years ago, rich people discovered that taxes are low in Switzerland. So a lot of rich people moved to Switzerland. And now you have the situation that in a village in the Swiss Alps, say it has 100 inhabitants. It's a small number, but you know, 100 people in the village 99 of which are farmers and one is a billionaire because of the tax haven nature of Switzerland. What is the average income? Probably like some 200 million a year, right? Because most of them earn something, whatever, 100,000, and one guy has more than a billion. And you look for the mean value, and the mean value will be very, very, very large because of that one outlier. But if you go for the median, that is, you sort the yearly incomes in an ascending order, and then you go for this number, it will be not so large. And it will therefore um, be more closely related to what is really going on. In statistics, we say that the median is a robust statistic in the sense that it does not suffer from outliers. The billionaire is an outlier. And, and the billionaire moves the average income to a very high number, which is not realistic for the remaining 99 people. So in that sense, if we compute these mean filters in an image, and there are some pixels in, in a local neighborhood that have a very bright or very dark value, they might distort the local mean. They might be outliers. 
in particular, say, with respect to salt and pepper noise. And this either black or white. And if we compute the mean, well, then it might be moved to, to very bright or very dark pixels. But if we compute the median, it doesn't really suffer so much from the totally different nature of certain outliers, but goes for the uh, number at the center here. In this operation, if we are given, well, I should have called it G, I guess. So uh, <laughs> this, this is an unfortunate choice. Uh, if we're given an image and we want to compute a new image, now it's called F the new image. So if at every pixel X and Y in this new image, we assign it this media number, where the median is computed from local neighborhoods in, in the original image. This is called media filtering. Right? So we have an image. For every image, we have to look at local neighborhoods of every pixel. We have to sort the values in those local neighborhoods and then select the, the middle number, the number in the middle, not the mean value, but the number in the middle. And this number is being assigned to the pixel we are currently considering. Then that is called median filtering. Why is this not a linear operation? Well, we talked about what it means for a, uh, a mathematical operation to be linear. Hmm? Louder! Exactly, exactly. Because of the sorting, because of uh, this term ordered set here. We're given nine numbers, we have to rearrange them such that they are now ordered or sorted in an increasing fashion, and that is something that is not linear. That is something, if you check it against the equations we use to define what it means to be linear, uh, those equations would not survive this sorting process. Very nice. Okay, here is an example of a um, pixel and we are looking at a certain uh, x and y coordinate and we have a 3 by 3 neighborhood. Um, and here is the ordered set of all the pixel values, gray value pixels in this neighborhood. What is the median? Let's <coughs> emphasize it exactly 231, right? Because this is exactly, uh, we have nine numbers, and one of them is exactly in the center, and this is the median. Let's look at this. This is um, somewhat of a funny example. Um, it appears, let's, let's try to understand this image, as if there is an edge here, right? Because we have a couple of dark pixels. And then there are rather brighter pixels. Well, there's a dark one here as well. So it's like somehow it's actually it's a corner. Right? Here is a dark area of the image, uh, sort of medium, medium gray area. And these are pixels that are brighter. And there are four bright pixels and uh, five bright pixels and four rather dark ones. And um, so in this situation, well, five is more than four. So it's likely that the median value indicates the fact that this, is, is, it, this local neighborhood is at large cases, or in many cases, brighter than, than, than in, in the um, other cases. So there are five brighter pixels and four darker ones, and uh, this is actually reflected by the median value. Here is another, uh, just from looking at it, without, without uh, what would be the median? Yes. <laughs> you see, uh, <laughs> and this is, this is because of what I just said, right? The, the, the media sort of cares for the majority, like as in the Swiss Alps. 99 people with a decent income and one outlier that totally distorts the uh, statistics, the media would ignore the outlier. Here we have six zeros, three ones, and of course the media is zero. But it works. So then just from looking at it, we can also sort it and then go for the middle and it works. Okay. Um, yeah, let's let's have a look at medium filtering in action. Here is the original. 
Here is the 3 by 3 million, 5 by 5, 9, 9, 9. Notice that I indeed am so lazy. Uh, you see these boundary effects here, the black pixels. It's the same uh, problem we've been talking about uh, last uh, week before last week. Right? Is that you know, if you move these things across the image, you have to worry about the boundaries. I don't. I just start computing them uh, wherever they fit, which is to say, uh, there are no if clauses that would say, am I on the boundary? Because I move these masks starting here. And that is to say that a certain border around the image, there will be nothing computed because it would, you know, the mask would extend beyond the borders for these pixels that are black here. So, you know, just initialize an area of low zeros and compute the new values where the mask begins to fit. So this is why we have this borders here, these decorative borders. Does not have to be the case. Once again, it depends on what you choose to do in your implementations. And maybe sometimes you can ignore those borders, sometimes you can. I'm just saying. But what we can see here is uh, the following property of the median filter. Now, if we increase the size of the mask, um, details will go away. So like these lots of tiny hairy things here are not visible anymore. But um, locally dominant structures will remain. In particular, say this black ring here uh, does not go away by means of media filtering. Of course, the majority of all the pixels in the neighborhood of this one is black or rather dark. So by medium filtering, we'll set this pixel to a value that represents the majority of the pixels in that neighborhood. Yeah, um, that is all I have for today. Um, we have studied well, ever so briefly, I cannot really think of any, any real-world application that would require you to compute mean filters. Um, but our study of mean filters, a very brief study of mean filters, at least allowed us to get used to the idea of integral images. Well, we saw that um, these really, really simple filters, instead of using convolution or separate convolutions, we can use this uh, idea of integral images. And we saw that integral images can be computed rather efficiently. And once we have this uh, integral of integrals capital C, we can compute the sub-integrals just in terms of four operations. And we begin to study the notion of median filters. Uh, and we will continue that next time, and I don't know why, I'm probably it's too fast today. Um, what would you say is the effort of computing these median filters? Hmm? N log n. Yeah, n log n, exactly. Um, because we, we you know, have to sort of get this neighborhood, but let's ignore that. And then it has to be sorted. And sorting is something that can be done in n log n. Um, the worst case might be, might be even worse, but n log n is, is something uh, we can achieve. It's because we have to sort of order the set before we can select the uh, middle number. So it's n log n. Oh, um, next time, uh, yes, we, there's a lot we can do. <laughs> there is a lot we can do. Next time, we will see that this can be done in O of 1. Right? And um, this is, in a sense, and I have to be very careful now, aching to this. So there are, again, neat tricks we can apply so that those median filters can also be applied in constant time. It does not matter how large the neighborhood we is, we can compute this like, like so. 
Um, it is not exactly the same, you'll, you'll see that, but um, what I'm trying to get across today and next, next time is that image processing can be done naively and can be done very, very smartly. And I am a sucker for speed. If we can do something fast, we should do it fast. And this is what we're going to study next time. We'll see that media and filters can also be computed in O of 1, that is constant time, independent of the size of the neighborhood, independent of the fact that it looks as if we have to do sorting. We can avoid that. But one, one more thing um, I should have, now that I'm thinking about it, should have stressed it. Um, yeah, let's either look at this one or this one. The fact that this can be done quickly, or even that this can be done quickly, has to be bought. What, what is it? What is the currency we have to pay to make it fast? So let me go back here. We are interested in this we can do it fast, but in terms of what do we have to pay for this? Memory. Who said it? Excellent. Memory. Because, um, you know, we would not need all this. We can compute this directly. Mm -hmm. Sorry for flipping back and forth, but I should have said. We can compute this directly. It, it takes time, because for every pixel we have this double summation. We have to sum over every pixel. It takes time. Here, the operation is fast, but it requires us to compute something else first. And this is, this is a perfect example for the fact that in computer science, there's always a trade-off between speed and memory consumption. Sometimes, you can do something ridiculously fast at the expense of more memory. Sometimes you can do something at a low memory expense, but it takes much more time. And it's usually, I have never seen an example in my life where both is, is low. <laughs> so it's usually either the one or the other. With the main memory of modern computers, um, size of the main memory of modern computers actually pays off to, you know, you read an image and even it's like thousands of pixels, I don't know, you create a copy of the image with an like memory is not memory has become cheap. Right? What what is always a rare resource is patience on the side of the user. Right? If you I don't know use Photoshop and you start some effect and then go have a coffee and return two hours later it's still computing, nobody accepts that anymore. So speed is is more important than memory and memory has become cheap. Here we see an instance of the fact that we can do something ridiculously fast at the expense of additional memory and um, the same we will see next time holds for the idea of media and filtering. It can be done ridiculously fast at the expense of memory. That is all I have got for today. Do you have any questions? Great, then uh, we meet again on Thursday. Thank you.